Okay, so first off, uh, lab comments, questions? <laughs> Charge your shoulders, whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, the la once you've saved it to the TFTP server, the last lines in that walk you through it, but basically you just invert that command. You say copy TFTP to startup-config, and then it'll ask you for IP address, source file name, and that's it. Do you need to do anything special after you've loaded it? Reload. Reload. Yeah. yeah. Basically, what you're doing is overwriting startup-config. And... You know, when you save it out, you're saying take startup-config and so we don't end up with one startup-config that every one of you overwrites, which changes the name of it. When you bring it back, you specify that file and say overwrite startup-config. So. Okay. Okie dokie. Well, then what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to start getting under the hood a little bit of SIP. Um, as I mentioned, there are multiple voice over IP protocols out there. If you, <laughs> I feel about as confident about, about making predictions of SIP. There are very few things in this world I feel confident about making predictions of. This is one of them, that SIP's going to be probably the major protocol out there, at least for the next five years. Um, I don't know if it has actually surpassed the other ones. I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but as of two years ago, it was gaining rapidly on all the other installed protocols. Um, certainly, all of the manufacturers are supporting it. Cisco now supports SIP. Pretty much anybody that's a player in uh, voice over IP supports it. Um, we'll, we'll dig into SIP more deeply and specifically as we go through the semester and look at different pieces. My goal today is just to give you an idea of what's going on under the hood with what we've done so far. Uh, I've, I've walked real carefully around using much of the SIP geek speak for now because I wanted you to concentrate on how dial planning worked and those fundamentals of doing voice networking. Before we go much further, we start complicating our world by, you know, taking it out of this nice little IP-only box with local networks and moving it over terrible things like wide area nets and talking to the PSTN and all that. We need, we need to start getting an idea of how this is laid out. So what we're going to do is really take a look at um, stuff you've already been using. We've talked about identity since the start of the semester. And I've been kind of periodically asking you questions about what makes this destination on a voice network different than other destinations. When we talk about PSTN, it's easy. It's circuit switched. This pair of wires, ultimately, is what you go to for the identity. And that identity is whatever's programmed on the switch port that that pair of wires attaches to. That's why on the old wired networks, I can go to Walmart, buy a $10 phone, take it to your house, plug it in, and it will ring with your phone number. I take that same phone, take it to my house, and plug it in, and it'll ring with my phone number. That phone doesn't have an identity. The identity is in the port on the switch that it's attached to. That's the world we're moving away from. Quite honestly, there are a couple of things that network does better, but for the most part, Packet networks are just a lot more flexible, which is what we're going to start getting into. You guys are used to working with packet protocols, so a lot of this I'm going to kind of beat on things that I want to make sure you pick up on because they sound, oh yeah, I've heard this before, and I'm going to try to get you to see them through the lens of a voice network. Because we're, we're kind of in an interesting situation here. Most of what you've looked at so far have been computer to computer or computer application to computer application protocols. <laughs> you know, you look at routing protocols. What are the devices that are actually communicating there? What's the information used for? Routers. You know, if I look at DHCP, I have a computer coming on a network asking for an IP address. Okay, when I look at voice, now I've got a human hanging off the end of this network. And I'm going to take something that is uniquely human 
move it across this data network and turn it back into something that at least is pretty reasonably a facsimile of what we started with. That's a whole different world. You know, and we're going to, once we get the pieces in place, we're going to start throwing rocks at that and see what we can do to make that break. Uh, it's surprisingly easy to do, as a matter of fact. What we're going to do today, though, is just look at the architecture of SIP. Now, as I mentioned, there are multiple protocols. All of them accomplish the same thing. You will see a similar layout if you looked at MGCP or H323 or one of those. And we'll, we'll, we'll kind of look at the difference of those a little later. But basically what you're talking about is a, is a client-server distributed architecture. Um, when you see, now, I'll preface this with saying I could have recreated this entire thing. You're going to see slides that look like this a lot. I could have recreated this whole thing. AdTran has an absolutely wonderful SIP training <laughs> piece. In fact, I'm going to put you on to a couple of them. But uh, I'm, I pulled uh, graphics from there, so you'll, you'll see these periodically through the semester. Basically, when we start talking about SIP, you're talking about a, a, one of the first applications that was actually written to do voice on a packet network from the point of view of people who had always done data. How do you get to Amazon.com? What do you type in? Amazon.com. Anybody know the IP address of Amazon? No. Do you care particularly? I mean... <laughs> Odds are in this class, in this major, you're going to find more people that care than usual. And most of us don't really care what Amazon's IP address is. The point is, we've learned to do things by creating identity. Amazon, www.amazon.com defines a service that lives on specific computers at a specific router at a specific switch on something we call the Internet. Now, define the Internet. <laughs> We're doing a similar thing here. What we do with SIP is we're going to have functions that have to happen to solve particular pieces of this process. Now, in small installations like ours, we're probably going to house all of those services on one machine. It's like, you know, if you have a small network with 10 people, you're probably not going to run an AD server, a separate DHCP server, a separate file server, a separate print server. No, you know, for 10 people, you're going to put it on one machine. We've got the same thing going on with SIP architecture. There's several things we have to accomplish, and those things are services that we offer to the network. In simple networks, those services are housed on the same device. As we scale this, and one of the key advantages of SIP over some of the other protocols is that it scales very well. Cisco's proprietary protocols also scale very well. In fact, SIP was written looking at the way Cisco scales. Uh, Cisco had a lot to do with writing SIP, as a matter of fact. Um, so as we go through this, what you're going to see is we have a... URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. Now, you've already used these. You ever typed in a URL? You've used the idea of a URI. This is a unique combination. Let me get my hide-behind platform out of the way here. This is a unique combination of user and domain. If you've ever sent or received an email, <laughs> yeah, I'm expecting somebody to raise their hand. No, I never have. You've used this system, jhart at murraystate.edu. I am the user jhart. That is unique to me on this campus. At domain. And the domain is msunet2k.edu uh, <laughs> or, or murraystate.edu. We have a couple of them. In SIP, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to define a domain, and we're going to define users there. You've actually already done this. When you created user accounts, you created users. What, were, what did you name your user accounts? What was their identity? And be careful before you answer. What was their unique identity? User 
user account, okay. That was a, that was a user name, but what uniquely identified that account? Extension number, exactly right. Remember I said that we could do this with names and such, but just because everybody likes phone numbers, we stick with it. What you did was create a user that was an extension number. One of the things you'll see pretty quickly as you go into the industry is you're going to see that, I think, starting to change. You're going to start seeing the form J Hart at Murray State being used as a legitimate phone endpoint. To do that, we've got to stop using the PSTN structure, which is what's holding everything up right now. More on that later. Right now, what we end up doing is emulating that PSTN structure by assigning numbers, extension numbers, in the user part of this. What's the domain? And you actually looked at this when you are in the lab, although we didn't make a big point of it. The domain is that particular server. Now in here, I'm not doing DNS. I'm, be, I'm being very careful to keep things as clear as I can, and that means keeping it strictly to IP. Your domain is the IP address of your server, your 7100. So you all use 10.10.10.1 as the domain. So your users, if you go in and look, and you'll see this, uh, You'll see this in the lab we have this way. I had to stop and think through what the debug messages you're going to look at are. You'll see 111 at 10.10.10.1 or something to that effect as you make calls. Okay. So some of these pieces that we have to do really have to do with, with how do we make this generic device, this hard phone in the case of an IP706, you know, it looks like a phone, it's got dial pad, you pick up the handset and all that stuff. Or this soft phone, which is an application I'm running on a computer, you're running them on the VM in the lab. How do I make that generic piece that everybody can go out and buy into my phone? You know, what makes it different? And the, the answer is we assign an identity to it. So once you create a user account, now you've got to associate that with something we can use to deliver the calls. Now we've gone through this before, but I want to start associating it with the names of the services you're going to see. So that process of taking the user and associating it with an endpoint, either the 706 for a hard phone or a soft phone, is something you do through the registrar server. And its job is to keep up with what identity goes with which IP endpoint. Remember when you had users coming on, you could look at that uh, user account screen. It would tell you what IP address it was. That's the registration process working. Okay. We also may use proxies. What does a proxy do generically? Not a voice over IP proxy, just what's a proxy do in IP networking? If I'm going to send you as my proxy out in the world to go fight this really big guy down on the corner, what am I telling you to do for me? <laughs> go down and fight that guy on the corner for me, you know, <laughs> so he can beat me up and I don't get hurt. So, proxy servers act on behalf of a user. Now, they're not mandatory in a voice over IP environment. And in fact, we're not going to use them a whole lot in here because they do complicate things. Uh, I want you to learn the basic messaging, so we're not going to actually do proxies until fairly late in the semester. But proxies act like a user, we're going to define that term a little closer as well, act like a user on one side and then are going to turn around and act like a server on the other side. So if you, the user, need to go somewhere and I've made it so that you have to use a proxy, you're going to send a message to me, I'll act as a server facing you, and then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to act like you, I'm going to be your proxy facing out to the world. Okay. Now why do I show two proxies up here? There are a lot of situations where you may want to do things differently when you send calls off a network than when you bring calls into a network. And so there are both inbound and outbound proxies. Um, we will play with these. 
This is probably the thing that breaks more networks than anything else. NAT requires a proxy to get around. Okay. Okay, so more on proxies a little later. We also need to talk about location. Now, by location, I don't mean geographic no location necessarily. I'm talking about location from an IP point of view. Where in the architecture of this network is this user? How is that different from a registrar server? Well, a registrar says this is where this user is now. Location services, depending on how I implement them, are these are the places, plural, that I see this user, or these, this is the place this user normally is if they come from somewhere else to do something different. Okay. So in other words, it allows us to play games with this simple association we have here. This is, here's the IP, here's the user. Next. This one lets us play some games. Remember my story about Clotilde Tucker and my mother calling from Fort Knox and all that stuff? That's where location services comes into play. We can handle that situation numerous ways, but all of them involve alternate locations or alternate ways of delivering a message. Okay. So we'll, we'll dig into that one a little later. Redirect. Redirect is I send you a call but that call needs to go somewhere else. The, the one you think of is three-way calling. You ever done that? You know, click, click, send a call somewhere else. That's redirect. Maybe I have my number at my desk forwarded to my cell phone. That's a redirect. Maybe I have location services talking to the registrar and I see where my other location is, and I do a redirect from that. So I can do this dynamically. Begin to see how we can deal with that Clotilde Tucker situation. These three work together to keep track of user versus network location. Okay. Again, in here, we're going to take a fairly basic view of that. But we'll, we'll dig into it a little more later. Gateway services. Generically, in terms of the OSI model, what's a gateway do? It's, it, in terms of default gateway, it's where everything goes and it where it's going. Okay. Um, default gateway is actually a different concept. If I'm implementing a gateway, a gateway translates from one protocol to another. So I might have... Uh, one you used to see a lot, for example, was IP to SPX, IPX SPX, which was a, a Novell protocol. You don't say that anymore. What we're doing here is when we have to change signaling types. On this side of the world, I'm speaking SIP. You know, I know how to deliver calls within all of this. We've done it. What happens when I have to deliver calls out to the PSTN? That's a circuit switch world. I'm going to have to change modes of how I say this is where I want to go. How do I code voice? How do I <coughs> select a path? All of that. That's what gateway services do. All of these are things we will play with this semester. Some of them more than others. We're going to do a lot with gateway. We're going to do a lot with registration server. We'll do somewhat less with redirect. We'll look at location and we'll play with proxy mostly from the point of view of using it to solve some problems you get into if you're going to do NAT, for example. Okay? thing to remember is that this is a distributed, scalable architecture. You have to think about these in terms of service delivery rather than this is on this box. Now, our world in here is pretty simple. Most of this, as we go through our labs, we'll live on one box. And so when you've been working on this 7100. But for example, as we add remote sites, all of those sites are going to register with that central site. So the registration process will live there. What about 
the situation where I have a phone and it's at the main site and I unplug it from there and throw it in my briefcase and I go to the auxiliary side and I pull it out of my briefcase and I plug in that phone. What, which of these services have I just pulled up? Have I changed the user identity? No. Right. I've changed the registration process is going to see me coming from somewhere else. Therefore, I'm going to put in location services and work on through. So I've got to know that change to be able to deliver calls. Okay. okay. So what actually goes on when, we, when we've been doing these labs? Um, we've, I pretty carefully avoided you having to deal under the hood because I wanted you to look at uh, the um, dial plan implementation first. First and foremost, you have to remember we really have two worlds here. First off is the hard phone world. A hard phone is just simply an IP network host that's shaped like a telephone. <laughs> you take the lid off of it, it's a computer. It's got a network interface, it's actually got a network switch in it. It's got enough processor and memory and all of that to do voice coding. You're going to take analog audio and code it to a data stream. We'll look at how that happens a little later. But basically it's a computer. And so the first thing we're going to do is turn it on and let it boot. And it's, it has its own little operating system. It's not really recognizably so, but it is, it is a flavor of Linux in there. And it's going to boot. It's going to do its own power on self-test. And it's going to load enough operating information to assume that it's connected to a network. Okay. Now, can it work without being connected to a network? No. This is a device that is designed to be on an Ethernet network. It will not deliver calls without it. It may sound obvious, but it's worth saying. <laughs> okay, so we're going to connect it to a network. The major en environment that you see in the world now, this our labs may be the last place you see an actual live touch it hub. <laughs> Pretty much the world has switched to Ethernet switching, which means that we have switched to VLANs. What's a VLAN? I'm sorry? Okay. What is a VLAN? Let me ask the question another way. What does a VLAN allow us to do? Or what do VLANs allow us to do? Essentially, we get to put more than one network on the same uh, on the same wire. Same physical, exactly right. I can, ins I, instead of having to physically separate each Ethernet network, I can actually take the 24 ports on my switch. By default, they're all in one network, VLAN 1 or VLAN 0, depending on whose box you're looking at. And I can divide those. I can define VLAN 10 and say that ports 1 through 8 are on VLAN 10. And what I've done is logically sliced those out of that switch and made them a separate network. I haven't carved the ports up or cut any traces or anything like that, but I have logically made that a separate network, which means ports on VLAN 10 can't talk to any of the other ports on that switch without going through a router, right? Layer 2 only knows about one network. To talk to another network, you must pass through Layer 3. Okay. I've alluded to the fact this semester that voice has its own issues with networks. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're people and we have expectations of what we want voice to do. We don't want it to, I don't want there to be a time delay between when I speak and you hear me. Now necessarily there is, even in the old PSTN network, there's a delay, but it's pretty short. Packet networks, by virtue of the way they fact, can build up very long delays. Very long, very high latency. The second thing we don't like as people is if I have to have delay, okay, you twisted my arm, we're going to have delay. Now I want it to stay the same. 
I don't want it to be 10 milliseconds, then 100 milliseconds, then 50 milliseconds, then 150 milliseconds, 30, 60, you know. I want it to stay the same. Give me something nice and predictable, okay? What do you think, if you had to characterize the amount of data and the rate of data used to carry the human voice across the network, would you say it's pretty fairly consistent over time, fairly consistent amount of data? Yeah, it is. <laughs> you got a 50-50 shot, say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. When I code the human voice, particularly with modern algorithms, I end up with a fairly predictable amount of data. And if you look at it in the, milli, you know, the millisecond or tens of millisecond intervals, it gets a little bursty. But over a period of a second or two human time frames, it's pretty consistent. Okay. Computer data, those other applications, routing protocols, things like that, tend not to be that way. They tend to be very, very bursty. How worried do you get if the delay in downloading the onion? Anybody here an onion fan? Okay. <laughs> if you go to download the current day's version of the onion, how upset do you get if there's a 50 millisecond delay in getting it downloaded? You don't. It just doesn't matter. I add 50 milliseconds to your average voice call and you're going to notice. I add 100 milliseconds to it and you're not going to like it. I add 200 milliseconds to it and you're going to change the way you use the phone. You're going to stop having two-way conversations, you know, fully interactive, you know, I talk, you talk, we overlap, all that. That stops at a fifth of a second. I mean, this is short on a human time frame, but it's enough that we notice. I'm going to start talking like two-way radio, so I'm going to finish what I have to say. I'm going to make this big stop, and I'm going to wait for you to talk. And you're going to talk, 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 and you're going to stop. And we don't even think about doing this, but it happens. Okay. The other thing, have you ever been on a cell phone call? It get like this. What's going on there? Yeah, I'm losing data. Remember what I'm moving across that link is my voice coded, <laughs> sent as packets, so that you can rebuild my voice on the other end. Well, if you lose the packets, there's a big chunk of my voice you can't rebuild. Okay. Both of those are network operational issues. The first one is latency, which means I don't want my voice traffic delayed, so what happens if your download of last night's episode of uh, Big Bang Theory gets in front of my voice call? Again, is 50 milliseconds going to matter on your Big Bang download? No. It's noticeable on my voice call. So I'm going to want to treat data, I'm going to want to treat transfer across my, of my voice differently then I treat your download. One of the ways we do that, or one of the things that, it that enables us to do that, is the use of VLANs, because I can actually separate traffic out and say, okay, this traffic we're going to treat this way, and this traffic we're going to treat this way. There are other tricks we use. That's a very fundamental one. Okay. So why did I go that far from here? Because when this phone boots up, it sees that it is attached to a switched Ethernet network. And one of the things it does is learn what VLANs are on the port that it's attached to. If you watch closely, and you will, <laughs> if you watch closely, you'll notice that this thing actually boots twice. First time, it does what any normal computer does. It'll come up, it'll start its power on self-test and check its memory and processor and all that stuff. At the end of that, it's going to do a DHCP request. Doesn't know anything about the network. It's just going to layer to say, I need an address. The DHCP server on that network segment is going to say, OK. Since the phone doesn't know anything about the network environment yet, the only VLAN that it can use is the default VLAN. Okay? 
So it's going to get an IP address from the range assigned to the default VLAN. Great, except that may probably isn't what I want to use for voice. Question? It's okay. It's exactly where I'm heading. If I don't answer that in the next two minutes, eh, give me three. Stop me, okay? So once this phone boots and it comes up and asks for an IP address on the on the default network, it will get it. Then it's going to learn what VLANs are out there. How does it do it? Because there's actually a layer two switch, an Ethernet switch built into this phone. It's a three port switch. Why do you say, if you look at the back of the thing, there are only two ports. Yeah, if you look at the back of it, you've got the VLAN trunk coming in, and you've got the one you plug to your PC. Where's the third VLAN? It's internal, because it's used by the phone. So what happens is we'll learn that Say, I'll use AdTrans names, VLAN 10 is the voice VLAN, and VLAN, I'm sorry, VLAN 20 is the voice VLAN, VLAN 10 is the data VLAN. So what the phone will do then is learn about those VLANs. It will configure its switch to pass the data VLAN to the PC port and the voice VLAN to the phone port. Okay, great. So all the processor and stuff that deals with voice now has its own VLAN. But our IP address is on another VLAN. So I'm going to go back and ask for an address on the voice VLAN now, and I'm going to reload with that voice VLAN. So now, with this one physical phone, you have a PC on the data VLAN, and you have a voice phone on the voice VLAN. From a network point of view, those are on two different networks. We'll dig into that a little later. So we do our DHCP request. We get our DHC back, DHCP back on the voice VLAN. We actually have to go through this process twice. Uh, first for the generic network, then uh, to get us configured on the voice network. One of the things that comes back the second time DHCP can do a lot more than pass, if you remember Marsh's class, you can do a lot more than just pass IP address information. I can pass all kinds of things, you know, time servers and all that. One of the things we're going to pass is where a TFTP server is. So I'm going to be able to do file transfer. Hmm, why would I want to do that? And I'm going to do, I'm going to pass the location, the IP address of the SIP server for this network. Now realize where we are. I have a phone. It knows where the SIP server is, and it knows how to transfer data. It knows where files are stored. So the next thing it's going to do is go out, and it's going to ask for an image. You remember the file you create when you built a user for the IP706? It created that phone config file that was tied to the MAC address. That's what it's asking for. Because how is that phone communicating on layer two? What address is it using? It's using its layer two address, which is its its physical its MAC address, right? So when it communicates with that voice over IP server, it's going to identify itself by MAC address. The server is going to look through its list of phone config files, see one that matches the MAC address, and send back its image. That image contains all the stuff you created when you created the user and associated it with that phone. Okay, seeing how it's coming together now? Now I have, I have hardware configuration that is associated with a specific phone and I got that by associating that with a specific user. Okay, I have a phone on a voice VLAN, so now I have an identity that's unique in the world for this phone. Okay. The last thing it's going to do, since it knows who it is, it knows where the server is, is it's going to send a registration message saying, hello, 
I am going to send it on IP to the IP of the voice over IP server, which will put it into regist in, uh, registration, the registrar database. You'll say user 111 is at 10, 10, 10, 5. Okay. Now, after all that rigmarole, now I can send traffic to that phone. Okay. So there's an awful lot going on under the hood just to do the simple labs we've done so far. Okay. We're going to dig into pieces of this. It's going to feel a little overwhelming sometimes when I do. But <laughs> I guarantee you the first time you do a debug and you pick up the phone, never mind dialing, when you pick up the phone, it's going to go <laughs> and fill your screen up. A lot goes on. Okay. Don't worry about it. You guys have done this kind of stuff for a long time. You're just doing something a little different with it now. Same okay. stuff, just different words. Identical, exactly. Okay. If we are talking about, sorry, I got ahead of myself. If we are talking about a soft phone, what I just talked about was a hard phone, have the switch and everything. A soft phone is just software that you're executing on a general purpose computer. Right? This one's not shaped like a telephone. This one actually looks like a computer. And I can't use the MAC address for it. I could, but what happens if I want to run multiple applications that need MAC identity with it? And oh, by the way, you're probably not going to want to accept config files from another server somewhere on your computer. So we're going to change the way we do this. First thing that will happen is that computer, of course, boots. It does all its own DHCP stuff, all the stuff you've learned about. So it already has an IP address, and it's already associated with a particular IP network. When you boot the soft phone, remember what we had to do before you booted that. You went in and programmed the phone with a user account, you told it what your identity was, 111. You told it what domain it was on, 10.10.10.1. You gave it a password, although the default was there, it was 1234. So now you've got enough information to identify yourself to a server that knows what your username and password should be. So when I, send, when I boot that soft phone application, what it does is send a registration message. It says, hi, I am 111, and my password is 1234. Server looks up, 111, 1234, yeah. So what have we accomplished? <coughs> now I have a user, unique, user at domain. And I know what IP address we're at. Okay, now I can send traffic that way. Okay, we filled almost this whole class, and we hadn't even made a call yet. So there's a lot going on here. Okay, let's think about where are we on time? What time is it? Five minutes? Good. Ah, right, perfect. Let's think about things that can break this. First off, if I have the phone on VLAN 20, and data on VLAN 10, what are the, if I want to talk to the phone from the data VLAN, what do I have to pass through? At, yeah, I have to pass through a router because I'm going from one layer two network to a different layer two network. Yes, they're virtual networks, but it doesn't matter. They're layer two networks and they're different layer two networks, and therefore I must use a router. Believe it or not, people will implement this whole thing and never turn on routing. <laughs> Why doesn't it work? <laughs> some of them can call, some of them can't. Well, let's think about that. Other thing, if I connect, using your question, if I have a hard phone that I've connected, and it's going to go on the voice VLAN because that's the way we set things up, and I have a computer plugged into that port behind it, what VLAN is the soft phone on that computer going to be on? Yeah, if 
I have a soft phone on the computer, it's on a different VLAN, right? So I can't get traffic between those two without passing through a router, okay? What happens if I'm going to talk to phones at another site and I don't want to give away information about the ins inside addressing on my network, so I do uh, overload NAT. What does overload NAT do? It takes a huge private range and it shares one externally routable address. So from the point of view of any other place in the world, every single call in the world coming out of that site comes from the same IP address. Okay? It can work. What usually happens is most networks implement a firewall so that unsolicited traffic is discarded, right? First security thing you do. If somebody sends you traffic that you haven't asked about, you throw it away. One of the things you're going to learn is that in SIP, all the signaling gets set up through the server. So my signaling path is just like this. If I'm going to call from soft phone to hard phone, I set up the call this way. Okay? So I'm used to seeing traffic that way, right? My firewall is happy. I'm getting traffic from something I've established a relationship with. When I actually dial the call and you answer the phone, what happens is we say, okay, now you transfer your data directly to this phone. Audio does not pass through the SIP server. What have I just done from the point of view of the firewall? I've sent an unsolicited stream of traffic. Boy, that's hard to say. Unsolicited stream of traffic to your router interface. And what are you going to do? You're going to throw it away. It's called asymmetrical routing. And it breaks a lot of voice networks. Okay. I don't do all of this to make the complexity overwhelming. I just want you to kind of get a handle on what's going on under the hood. We're going to dig into pieces of this deeply. Some of it I'm just going to say, here's the gospel, take it. You know, I'll give you some reading if you want to do more. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll see you Wednesday. We're working towards um, a lab that's going to have you look at this. Um, so we'll see you Wednesday. Yes, sir. I know the lab is supposed to be due at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Is there any way I can extension to do it tomorrow? Sure. sure. Is the way the work schedule and everything worked out, I wouldn't be able to do anything. That's fine. So I'll get it to you. That's fine. I trust you. So I can't really came to the realization that the um, dial plan that I turned in to go with the lab three, mm -hmm. I probably did it wrong. Okay. Um, for my two-digit dialing, which I'm pretty sure I did wrong, I used XX. I don't think that's going to work. What does XX match? Well, XX matches any first two digits. Any two digits. Hit. Yeah. So I probably need to use 4X, 7X, and 8X, okay. which is not difficult to go back and fix. but um, as far as my dial plan, what's going to be in my lab is going to be different than what I turned in. That's fine, because I wanted you to pick up on stuff exactly like that. That's yeah. that's the whole reason I had you I put the dial plan you yeah. put on paper in the machine. Include, include that in your notes. Okay. As far as mm -hmm. my... What are we doing for a lab report this time? I'll, uh, I'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. So we're not doing one now. I'm going to have, I'm gonna have you analyze exactly okay. that kind of stuff. As far as I haven't put it up yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as far as the... Three-digit dialing between sites. Now we mm -hmm. haven't actually set that up yet because that's going to go to the trunks, I assume. I'm going to guess we're effectively using a steering digit. It's it's up to you how you do it. Uh, steering digit is about the most straightforward way to do it. Okay. Okay. Is that suitably vague? Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, steering digit is one way to do it. Okay. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Sir. Source and get those yeah, send them to me. On email or bring it in to you? Uh, email's fine. Okay, thank you. So. Oh, Sir? The thing I don't understand, mm -hmm. when, when we get away from the PHS scan and mm -hmm. D. Garfinkel is my phone number as well as my email address, how does they know which is which? Uh, because they're different protocols. The identity, it, in, I'm trying to, this is like, 
how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? You're talking, what you're talking about is converged networking, and where you have one identity associated with multiple users. Yeah, it looks like that's what would happen. If but, it, yeah, yeah, but think about layer four. See, I'm going to have ports for layer four associated with mail traffic for your email oh, okay. application. So I'm going to have ports for layer Even four associated. It's the same identity, it's a different port for each aspect yeah. of it. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. So. That, okay, that but it can, break, it can break very quickly for exactly it, that it reason. It seems like if you can put the same identity on your Watch out, there's a man with a loaded radio behind us. <laughs> what do you think? So unrelated to class, um, I need to start, I need to build a resume to start looking for okay. internships. I don't really know where to start with that. Where's, I need Best to thing to do is go over to career services and let them, services. let them help you. A good, good starting point is that? Yeah. Career okay. fair is Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. That's Day after tomorrow. Yeah. Wear a suit or they won't let you. Yeah. yeah. What time Business is that? Um, starts, starts at 10. Via 10. 10 to 2. Okay, mm -hmm. good, good. So. I can actually go to that. Yeah, but uh, career services is where you start for the resume. Okay, awesome. So. Thank you. Okay. What about it? Yeah, it's not going to work. Not going to do it? Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Man, I was hoping to get off cheap. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any places that you could use their controller based system as a standalone? I don't know. Um, I do have a project, though. Are you teaching me wireless classes this semester? No. You're not. Man. I got I am this fall. <laughs> what, you, what do you have? Miller Golf Course. Okay. They have their main building, which they have data, but they have this maintenance building. Uh -huh. mm, probably 20 yards, and they, they need connectivity. Okay. 22. Um, you need to be able to monitor it, though, don't you? <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, do you need to, are you trying to drop the price on that or just get somebody to design it? Uh, yeah, they want pricing it for Because the, the trench work to run fiber was going to mm -hmm. be um, about $10,000. 10, okay, so. So they, they are kind of balking, they balked at that. That's too much for them. Um, the 5 gig version of these, mm -hmm. you can put on sector antennas, set them up bridge to bridge and lock them. So that you know, people users can't associate with right. them directly. You can encrypt between it and all that stuff. It'd be with sector antennas. It'd be six hundred bucks for the whole what kind of, solution. What kind of you get? Uh, I'm running one eighteen mile, uh, twenty. I'm sorry, twenty eight miles right now. Hmm. Got another one running that's been running thirteen miles from here to Hamlin forever. <laughs> the only problem we have because we we did have a they have a have you been out to Miller? Uh, not in a long time. If you need to help them, you can. Uh, actually, what I need to do <laughs> is turn off my recording that I forgot about. <laughs>